Welcome to Across Africa, our weekly roundup of stories from across the continent. I'm Georgia Calvin Smith, and coming up, Chadian returnees who are forced back home from Niger following attacks by Nigerian Boko Haram fighters struggle to get by as they're denied refugee status. Also, female artists call for more recognition in African cinema after Rwandan director Joel Karakezi scoops the top prize at the Fespaco Film Festival. In 50 years, no woman has ever won the Golden Stallion of Yenenga. And across Africa, many traditional ways of marking key moments of life are disappearing. One group of women is painstakingly gathering documentation of rights native to dozens of countries. But first, nine years of attacks by Nigerian Boko Haram insurgents have displaced millions of people from around the Lake Chad Basin. The region includes several countries, one of which is Chad. Some who have fled there from Niger have not only lost their homes, but are now struggling to get by as they don't qualify for refugee status and are therefore entitled to less help. Our correspondents report. Alamin Tahe Ahmad is 40 years old. He's Chadian, but spent all his life in Niger. Because of Boko Haram attacks in Niger, he came to Chad two years ago. But it doesn't feel like home. We have not been here in Chad for long. We grew up in Niger. We don't know anyone here. We only know this camp where the Chadian government has told us to go. Other returnees show their Niger documents. They seek refugee status, but the Chadian authorities refuse. Because they don't have the status, they don't receive much international help. The World Food Programme and the IRC NGO are here, but no one else. 4,680 people live in this camp in very poor sanitary conditions. We envy the women who live in the nearby camp, where they have a health centre next door and their children can go to school. They also receive help. From all the NGOs that work in the camp, we really envy them. They dream of returning to Niger where they grew up, but the area is still not safe. In all, 20,000 Chadian returnees are facing the same fate. The top prize at Fespaco, the Pan-African Film and Television Festival of Ouagadougou, was won by Rwandan director Joel Kariseki. His film, The Mercy of the Jungle, scooped the prestigious award after a week of screenings and tough competition from across the continent. Our correspondents tell us more. Traditional song and dance kicked off the Fespaco awards ceremony at the Ouagadougou Sports Palace. Filmmakers and actors were amongst the 4,000 guests as were political leaders like the presidents of Burkina Faso, Rwanda and Mali. Rwandan director Joel Karikezi's film The Mercy of the Jungle won the most prestigious award of the festival, the Golden Stallion of Yenenga. So my film, uh, it's really the message behind is more about uh, Africa. Africa, it's, it's really a beautiful place to be. It deserves uh, to be in peace. And uh, yeah, we have to develop together. So it's really a hopeful message. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the message. Peace. Mark Zinger, who plays a soldier lost in the Rwandan jungle in the film, also scooped the award for best male performance. You can do it here. The award for best female performance went to Samantha Mugotsia, who plays a young gay woman in the film Rafiki. Directed by Kenyan director Wanuri Kayu, the LGBT love story was banned in Kenya. Viens voir le paradis à Paris. À 5 heures du matin, quand le réveil sonne, je tremble comme une vache folle. Franco-Algerian director Nadja Harek won the Bronze Foal Award in the short documentary film category for her portrayal of slam poet Tata Miluda, who expresses her suffering through spoken word. It's a magical moment for me right now. It's exceptional to receive a prize at Fespaco. Fespaco has given me the opportunity to feel Algerian. The 26th edition of Africa's biggest film festival also served as a platform to condemn sexual harassment by the continent's filmmakers in an initiative inspired by Hollywood's Me Too movement. The hashtag, not even scared, has gained traction as more women speak up against sexual misconduct in the African film industry. Women's place in African cinema continues to be a subject of debate 
as no woman has ever won the Golden Stallion of Yenenga, the festival's grand prize. Now, across Africa, many traditional rites and rituals are disappearing. Over 40 years of work on the continent have carried one group of women into remote corners of dozens of countries as they've documented vanishing customs. Shelley Sitbin tells us more. See these beautiful pictures? Angela Fisher and Carol Beckwith took a million of them. For over four decades, these Australian and American photographers traveled across 44 countries in Africa, filming thousands of hours of footage, collecting hundreds of precious artifacts, showing traditional rituals which are disappearing fast. This record of Africa won't be taken again. It can't be taken again. 40% of it is already lost. The photographers say rituals have changed or disappeared because the world has evolved. Here's one example. In Niger, the desert is advancing at a very fast rate, and it's pushing the nomad population into agricultural areas where they're unwelcome. So they're be the, either being forced to settle or being forced to move into areas that are alien to them, and they're losing their traditions. But ancient rites are not doomed. The photographers and this artist they've worked with for decades believe they can be preserved and transmitted. Nigerian textile, for example. Textile is dying off, and my own is to revive it and see whether one day the government will try to preserve it for us. So the young generation coming will be able to have a story on their textile. The photographers are now searching for a museum to take in their collection and help preserve African heritage. Well, amidst the couture frenzy of Paris Fashion Week here in France, one event turned the spotlight specifically onto the best of African luxury clothing brands. Amongst the creations on display at the Luxury Connect Africa event were those of Tiffany Amber. Now, it was founded in 1998 in Lagos by Falaki Coca. And two decades on, it's become the flagship ready-to-wear retail brand on the continent. This year marks Tiffany Amber's 20th anniversary. Falaka Coca told me how she and her team are planning on marking the milestone. I think we've, we're making a very conscious decision to open the Tiffany Amber universe to the world. We are, um, we plan on, um, we have a very special coffee table book that we're working on that puts together all the, the history of the, of the brand over the past 20 years, the legacy, what we've done so far. And it's, um, it's something nobody, we have, nobody has done in the past to, um, for, for a fashion brand on the continent. Mm -hmm. And we're also just generally encouraging, we're having loads of competition to encourage more fashion designers to, um, to go into the fashion industry. Because we, I mean, even though the fashion industry is still, it, it has so much publicity on it, it's still very much in, it, in its infancy on the continent. And um, we, we're trying to like do what we can to grow it a lot more. So you're doing what you can to grow it now, but 20 years ago, there was even more work to do and you were, you were bla 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 blazing the, the, the trail with ready to wear. Why was that such a big step at the time? 20 years ago, it was, um, <laughs> I'm not sure we could describe it as an industry then. Uh, Tiffany Amber was the first ready-to-wear label in Nigeria, and um, there was no blueprint for me to follow. I had to make up the rules as I went along. I mean, that, there, there's a lot of advantages to that because we, um, I made up the rules as I went along. I mean, sometimes some rules you made up didn't work out, and some did, but um, it, it wasn't cool to wear made in Nigeria or made in made in Nigeria. I won't speak for the rest of the continent. I'll speak for Nigeria because the, for Nigeria because the, the brand is a Nigerian brand. It's, um, it wasn't cool to wear made in Nigeria. So we've been told that Tiffany Amber made it cool to wear made in Nigeria. And that's very encouraging. And over the, it was accepted immediately we launched and then we realized there's a huge gap in the market for, um, for ready to wear brand by a Nigerian for Nigerian market. And then um, every year, year and after year, I mean, I'm a lawyer. I studied law. I had no formal training in, in fashion, but um, I guess I've always had a predilection for colors, textures, a couple with a very creative soul. So that made it easy, easy for me to really um, focus 
on the um, on growing a, a fashion brand. And what have you seen change about the African fashion industry in the 20 years that you've been in it? Okay, Tiffany Amber is a, a it's a women's brand. What I, the biggest change I've seen is the women. 20 years ago, women only wore made in Nigeria or made in Africa based on um, the traditional costume. When you travel, you wear whatever you can. You wear your Western wardrobe. With, there was no um, room for translation of your own personal style. But now, an African woman is very well traveled. And so much so that you're actually, uh, you're, you're being sought after internationally to, to share some of your experience in terms of raising brands in Africa. Oh yes, um, d this April, have you, I'm not sure if you know about it, the Condé Nast um, Luxury Conference is mm -hmm. supposed to be, it's to be the biggest luxury conference in the world. And we've been, I'm, I've been invited to be one of the speakers. And, and I guess, one of the re one of the main reason for this would be is because of the uh, all the attention the um, African women African fashion style aesthetic um, is getting all over the world. Flake Coca, the founder of Tiffany Amber, there speaking to me a little earlier on. Well, that's it for Across Africa for now, though. Do join us again if you can. Till then, take care.